Welcome to the Future of Field Service podcast. I'm your host, kind of, uh, Sarah Nicastro. Today's episode is going to be a little bit different. Uh, it's a takeover. Um, some of you are probably already familiar with Roy Dockery, who is the Vice President of Field Operations at Flock Safety, um, as well as being uh, a big voice in the industry. Um, and so Roy is actually going to take the reins of the podcast today and uh, interview me. So I'm going to hand it off. Oh, well, thank you, Sarah, for having me. And yeah, I know as a, as another one podcast host to another, sometimes we get tired of talking to ourselves or asking questions to others. So I figured we'd have some fun today. And since we're going to talk about your 2023 predictions, right, I'd interview you on some of the things and content that you've made this year. And then also we can discuss some of the things we've seen across the industry, different events, because um, you and I both frequent many a... Uh, <laughs> many of field service in service conferences. So we'll we'll jump right in. And I think the first thing that I want to talk about is the first prediction that you made was that companies will selectively increase cost reduction measures, right? And that was across scheduling optimization, asset management, right? Things like customer service, remote service, knowledge management. You had a lot of bullet points in there where they were going to try mm -hmm. to save on money. Um, from what you've seen, even from a customer engagement perspective, but even like in your road shows and things like that. Um, did that did that hold true? Do you see companies really trying to push costs down? Yes, I think so. Um, but I, it took a bit of a different lens than the way that I framed it coming into this year. So first I'll say I really struggle with the idea of predictions. Um, I think none of us really know, you know, what's coming. And I also think in this space, you know, people want this huge, you know, um, earth shattering what's next, when in reality, we're talking about sort of iterations of concepts, right? So um, it's tough. But uh, I think, you know, overall, companies, um, you know, based on economic uh, circumstance are certainly being more cost conscious um, this year and, and going into next year. Uh, the way I, I frame that out is uh, the reason I said selective is because, you know, it's not to the extreme of needing to take measures that are going to negatively impact the customer experience. And I think companies are smart enough today to also um, focus on protecting the employee experience, but it, it's more so about figuring out how do we work smarter? How do we do more with what we have? How do we grow and yep. expand without having to add cost, et cetera? I think what is a bit different than the way I framed it is I almost feel like the AI lens is the way that everyone talked about this topic this year, right? So what we're yep. really talking about with AI is any of those categories that I kind of bulleted out we're talking about bringing more intelligence into each of those things in a way that allows us to work smarter, right? That's really what AI is doing. It's just that that is the buzzword of the year. So that's sort of the lens everyone was looking at this through. But it is about, you know, what manual, menial, um, non-value-add tasks can we remove from our operations to better utilize the resources we have um, allow them to focus more on valuable uh, initiatives and m maintain or even improve our customer experience. So I yeah, think it was, and I, and it was I would say that, fair -ish. Uh, Yeah, like you said, and it's, yeah, so in that vein, and like you said, the working smarter, not harder. So like even on the advisory boards that I sit on, like you said, it's more of, you know, how do we use chat GPT, generative AI, to do more work with the same number of technicians, which is another way to frame smarter, not harder, right? Like yeah. we need to get more work orders done. Um, it's hard for us to onboard. It's hard for us to get new people. Um, we've got folks retiring. So how can we get more work done with the same number of people? Um, and then people are finding the challenges is as a technician leaves or if someone resigns, like there's a lot of questions now around that backfill. So mm -hmm. it's like, how do we more effectively use what we have um, and then what do we do when we start losing people? Because the um, the question is, do we invest in technology, like you said, to eliminate the mundane, repetitive, administrative task? so that the interesting thing is, right, we had all of this digital transformation that pushed a lot of non-technical work on technicians. Mm -hmm. Now we have to have like an AI revolution <laughs> to remove all of that administrative work 
so technicians can actually go back to just being technical mm -hmm. um, because it's it's a it's essential and there's a there's a lot less of them so we're we're trying to we're valuing that time better but I agree and like I said well, we've heard that same thing in advisory boards and the challenge there and like you said it's not like laying off or workforce right. reduction it's like I need you to do 20 poor, 20 percent more work next year but with the same number of people right so how are we going to accomplish it but so that's good. Not 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 very far off. Like you said, mm -hmm. AI and chat GPT came to buzzword for every event you attended in any aspect this year, even if you were dealing with education. I was at a legal event and they were talking about Gen AI. Mm -hmm. um, but on your so on your second prediction, which I'm I'm feeling some of this probably is still how much can we capitalize off the flexibility people gave us because of the pandemic? Yeah. Uh, your second um prediction was. Will, you know, will we still see wider acceptance of remote service? Like have 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 you um, or like your customers or people you interact with, do we see that trend going or are people starting to to get back to being complacent with other people doing things for them and, and not being as open to remote service as we thought the industry would keep moving in that direction? Mm -hmm. This is one where um, I think we need a little bit more definition behind what we're talking about when we think about remote service or what I was talking about, right? So in the vein I was thinking of it, yes, I think we've seen more progress, but not as much as I expected. And that I'll give you a couple of examples. So on the podcast, um, uh, Stephen Goldburn from Mettler Toledo came and talked about remote service. And I loved his take because what he was talking about is in their industry specifically, the idea of remote resolution is nearly impossible. Okay, so they're not trying to accomplish that goal. What they're using remote service for is historically they've done an on-site triage visit, visit before they ever went to actually do any of the work. So his point is there's technologies today that can allow us to you know, do things remotely that we don't need to do any longer in person. We have the capability to not do those things in person. So it isn't an idea of, you know, the the lens I think you're talking about when, when we were dealing with the pandemic, we got to a point where remote service in a lot of cases was the only way or the preferred way companies could serve service customers to the point of resolution, right? So I think there's sort of... Um, layers to this topic of, you know, is it is it remote service for information's sake from equipment to company? Is it remote service where you're using some of these capabilities to maybe have a, a older technician in the back office supporting younger, greener technicians? Is it remote service where it is true self-service and it's done with the customer with the goal of remote resolution? You know, I think those things um are all progressing at a little bit of a different clip. And yeah. I think this is another topic where AI kind of blended into, and in some ways, I don't want to say overshadowed because there is overlap, right? Like AI is one of the tools you can use to, you know, change what self-service looks like with your customers, et cetera. So, um, you know, it, it's kind of that buzzword, I think, took some of the steam away from, zeroing in specifically on the remote service piece. Um, yeah. And I think there's, I, I do think there's still a lot of opportunity there, not only opportunity, but importance for companies to really consider and clarify like what the topic means for their organization, because there's a lot of differences. And like I talked through, there's a lot of different use cases for the same set of technologies. Yeah, and I and completely agree. And I, and like you said, you've got those buckets. So like you've got you kind of have like remote triage, which is information gathering, and then you've got like your remote diagnostics, which is some level of troubleshooting, mm -hmm. and then there's remote repair. Right. Right. So a couple of years ago, we were all trying to get customers just to help us with triage. Mm -hmm. Right. Like just don't make me send someone there to read the alarm from the screen that I don't have remote access to. So this is the early adaption of like um, help lightning and rescue lens, like take your phone and point it at the thing mm -hmm. so I can see what's going on and we don't have to roll a truck for that. And then, like you said, during the pandemic, I think getting people who were non-technical or people who wouldn't typically 
you know, assist you with diagnostics or repair did. Right. But yeah. to your point, now a lot of remote services, how much AI can we feed to the customer to get them to do the triage, but then also try to walk them through the steps to get things done themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they all have progressed a little bit. I think we did see, and I would say like, I think we did see a bigger adoption of the triage kind of across industries, more people being willing to help you gather information mm -hmm. than before, right? You know, I come from a healthcare technology background. Like I used to have people tell me no to mm -hmm. turning around and looking at an alarm directly behind them. Yeah. Right. And we had to roll the truck. So I think the pandemics helped that. But to your point, the adoption for the rest of it and where that's applicable, depending on the complexity of the technology, safety concerns, right, customer comfort and all that stuff is moving along at a different one. But it is definitely another space where our friend Chat GPT and Gen AI keeps mm -hmm. getting inter in, um, thrown into that conversation. And I think, well. you know, that's the that's the real thing here is um now that these capabilities are as mature as they are, like it's 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 undoubtedly in my mind that we're going to continue to look for opportunities for, you know, why are we rolling a truck to do X when we could yep. use this? Why are we, you know, interfacing with customers this way when we could do Y, right? So those questions are going to continue to be asked. I think companies need to be, you know, not falling back into, well, we don't need to worry about that because the pandemic's over and we can kind of go back to the way it was before because, yep. you know, then they're going to fall behind. You know, you need to keep pressing and figuring out what it looks like for your organization. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, now to our, to the, your third prediction, which was around my favorite topic, right? Which is, um, is talent development and people development. So your prediction was that the talent focus would shift from new talent to nurturing talent, right? So, I mean, I know you and I have talked about the differences between hunting and farming, right? And kind of building that. So, and we also both got to attend the um, the vision, um, the the hot topic visionary, uh, service visionary leaders um, event um, along with the CDO and, um, and uh, chief technology officer event in London as well. And you know, and I and we shared before, like we've also noticed this trend of a lot of discussion around leadership at field service events, um, which has been like an interesting kind of um kind of shift from before, because it was a lot of technology, AI tools, processes, not a lot of focus on people and talent. Um, so given the fact that, you know, one, we've got people trying to recognize industry service leaders and visionaries um at that level, but then also what else have you seen? Um, as a train of with organizations or industries focusing on that talent development versus just recruiting or like trying to um, trying to bring in new people constantly. Yeah, no, I think this is um, also my favorite area uh, to to talk about, and um, you know, it might not always feel like progress is happening at the pace we want it to. But like, this is an yep. area where I feel like if you reflect back on, you know, what did the conversation sound like this year versus last year? Like, I think there's a distinct difference, right? And I think it it stems from the idea of nurturing talent, employee engagement, employee retention, employee satisfaction, and an acknowledgement that it is imperative. You know, I there we do not live in a world where talent is just going to stay put for 5, 10, 15, 20 years just because, right? It just, that world doesn't exist yeah. anymore. <laughs> so, I mean, it's forcing companies and leaders to reframe their approach and what's important and what works and what doesn't work. Um, and I think, you know, if anyone isn't familiar with the event you reference, so Hot Topics, which is... Um, a content and community uh, platform for C-suite executives that's based in London um, and IFS partnered to uh, do the first ever um, Service Visionaries Top 100 recognition. And it's the first time that, um, you know, there's been in those sessions, they've had this top 100 for some of the other, you know, uh, C-suite groups you mentioned, it's the first time they've recognized service leadership. And I think that's um, incredibly important. I was thrilled to be a part of it, but also um, 
you know, I can think of other examples. If if you were, I think you were at Field Service Palm Springs, you know, Christine um, Miner and Rick Lash, who wrote Once Upon a Leader, came and spoke about like leadership story. And, um, you know, one of my favorite podcasts this year was with uh, Venkata from Bruker Nano. And he talked very specifically about how he spends his time in percentage breakdown, 70, um, I think it was 70, 20, 10 or whatever on 70% of his time is, is focused on his team, his people and why. And he talked about the payoff of that and what it all means. And I think, you know, those conversations are invaluable because, um, you know, anything service organizations are trying to achieve when it comes to customer experience or growth or, or whatever it is, you know, you can't do without your frontline workers and, yeah. you know, what it took to, um, you know, have strong teams before is not the same as, as what it takes today. And so I love that there's this whole shift in focus on, you know, what leadership styles work? Um, how do our people feel? What's important to them? How do we create a culture that people will want to be a part of? You know, um, I think it's a, a really cool uh, evolution to see in this industry and really needed. Yeah. And like you said, it's an imperative. I actually spoke at it uh, um, at one of the field service events in September and I talked about um, the culture imperative, right? Like mm -hmm. we, we want, you know, we want people to stay, we want to nurture talent, we want to diversify our organizations, but like that requires the culture to change, right? Like they, you know, my shirt says the art of leading, but um, people know, anyone who follows me know I talk about leadership a lot, but um, it's very interesting to see the, the shift in the priority because like, yeah, like now you have so many generations in the workforce, even with field service, right? Now you've got baby boomers, Gen X, millennials and gen z so mm -hmm. you've got four generations of people um when you normally only relative you used to have two roughly like a lot of people aren't retiring as early um uh, people are, are are kind of coming into the industry earlier as well so it's it's really imperative that people start to focus on like how do you manage that like cross-generational leadership how do you have a culture that's inclusive to people who ideologically are very different, mm -hmm. but from um, with regards to their work ethic, their, you know, their passion around service is the same. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, you know, that's something that, and, you know, that I've, I've dealt with for years and, I've, you know, and I say it all the time, like I've never had a problem recruiting, um, right. but every company I go to, I change the way that they recruit mm -hmm. because you have to look at a different dynamic of people. You can't just look at the people who are here. You have to look at the generations and the type of people that you need to attract to be sustainable in the future. But yeah. no, but I like it. And like you said, it's it's uh, it's been refreshing, right? It, it, it trickled in a little bit in 2022, seemed a little bit more prominent in 2023. And so hopefully we see it more in 2024 um, I think, and it keeps being in the forefront as well. Yeah, I think another thing we need to be focusing on is the way leaders are developed in field service, right? So, I mean, you came in um, and came up through the ranks and you, know, you happen to be a great leader, right? <laughs> Um, yeah. But there are are some people who are put into leadership positions as uh, an acknowledgement of being a strong individual contributor that really aren't good leaders naturally or haven't been you know given the opportunities to hone those skills right and we know that leadership is under invested in um, by organizations in general so I think that as we acknowledge the importance of it. We also need to reflect on, you know, are we promoting people who actually want and can do the job well with help that, you know, companies are willing to invest in? So that's yeah. the other part of nurturing that is, you know, we think a lot about how do we bring in and then, you know, create a path for the frontline talent, but it, it needs to be looked at all the way through, right? Like it's, those are the next generation of leaders. So what are we doing to make sure that, you know, when they get those promotions, it's something that they can succeed at? Yeah. Cause like we, we focused a lot on employee training and we focused a lot on management training, but like a lot of organizations don't focus on leadership training, mm -hmm. right? which is somewhat different than managing the function, the people, the timesheets, the budgets, um, like you said, it's how do people feel? How do people behave? How do you interact with people? How do you deal with conflict? How do you deal with personality types and um, ideological differences, right? Um, mm -hmm. And all of those things. And it's important, you know, and, and even for me, that's one of the things as well. Like even, you know, one of the reasons I, start, I thought about writing a book, because I'm like, none of these things seem to apply, 
right? Um, especially when you're when you're leading people who are older than you. Mm -hmm. a lot. Everyone talks about leading millennials, but what about when millennials have to lead baby boomers right. or Gen X or Gen Z? So like um, being able to structure that is important. And so, yeah, I, I hope there's more investment in that um, in, in 2024 and, uh, in, and in moving forward. So, but that's good, but, um, great topic there on, on talent. So your, your other prediction was around sustainability, but for service centered sustainability strategies, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so one, ha do we continue to see a movement for sustainability in general, <laughs> right? Cause then, you know, people, you know, costs start getting tight and then some, some projects get set to the side. So, um, so I guess first your feedback on sustainability, but then on services uh, centered sustainability as well. Yeah. So this is probably one of the very few topics um, that we cover or that I talk about where there is pretty noticeable um, global differences. Right. So uh, the U.S. definitely lags when it comes to um a interest in or willingness to prioritize sustainability, um, especially when you get into uh, any amount of cost consciousness and, you know, um, that sort of debate. There's certainly exceptions. You know, I know um, you, uh, I think, also know Adam Gloss of McKinstry. Um, and, you know, that's it's it's a core focus for his company. It's something that's important to him and to them, but it's not oh an overarching um, tenant. I don't think for like to be able to say universally, right? In the yeah. U.S., it's a focus area. In Europe, it's a lot different, and it's a lot different. I think um, culturally, but it's also a lot different because of government regulations that force organizations to have to prioritize it differently. Um, so, you know, it, it's a conversation that is very different. I think what's interesting to me always is, um, you know, thinking about some of the reasons why it has to matter. Um, if you don't want to just acknowledge it has to matter for the future of our planet. Okay. And uh, one is, you know, it, it's, listen, quite frankly, there's a lot of ways in service, it's directly tied in with um, efficiency, right? Like if we're just yep. rolling trucks all the time to go see what's wrong somewhere, I mean, it's not only um, a complete waste of money, but it's also not environmentally friendly, right? So it's sometimes tied into um, benefits that maybe certain organizations do care more about, right? Um, the other thing is, you know, customer preference. I think more and more, um, in certain industries, it's going to become a area where customers make purchasing decisions um, based on whether companies care about it or don't um, and can show that. And same with um, investment uh, decisions, right? Like, um, you know, boards are starting to pay more attention to, you know, is this uh, an initiative? Is it something that you're putting effort into? So, I think the U.S., you know, is um, still, you know, significantly behind uh, where Europe is. It's also different because of, you know, the geography, right? Um, yeah. Like, we've had some conversations that are are really, um, you know, valid of if you take electric cars, for instance, right? Like, it's this country is gigantic, and the infrastructure doesn't necessarily exist to make the argument for, doing that if a service organization is op operating outside of a major metropolitan area, right? So there's, you know, um, some things that way that have to come along too. Um, but, you know, I think looking at the areas of overlap um, is really interesting. Uh, and I think it's something that's just going to take time to, you know, um, come into focus more here, aligned with how it does in Europe. Yeah. Okay, that, that's good. And we'll touch on that a little bit more. We'll talk about some of the road shows and some of this, these differences between the US and, and Europe and the, and the UK and things of that nature. But your your last prediction for 2023 was around this outcomes base, right? We've been hearing this for um, for years. Interesting shift for me, right? I went from a time and material service contract world to a almost completely outcome based. We don't sell equipment at all. We're a subscription based startup. 
Um, so for me, I almost did like a 180 degree flip and landed solely in uptime device health <laughs> and, and evidence capture um, in my in my new world. So I'm all the way at the other end of the spectrum where we're completely almost outcomes based, which is interesting. But uh, across the rest of the industry, for some of the traditional businesses that have been trying to move in this direction, um, do you to continue to see that? Have people have some people made a lot of progress or is it is it like a large ship that's hard to that's hard to turn quickly? Yeah, no, I think it's I think there's been a lot of progress made. Um, this is one that varies a lot industry to industry. But I think the overall premise, which is, you know, customers care less about what you do and really just about how it helps them is for sure true. I mean, it, it's, you know, we live in a world of complete and utter convenience and, um, you know, real time information exchange, like it just makes sense for customers to expect, you know, that level of streamlined um, experience from companies that they're working with. And, you know, I think when it comes to differentiation, um, caring more about how what you do benefits your customers or their businesses versus just pitching what you do. I mean, you know, it's it makes it makes sense from that perspective as well. So I think, you know, across industries, you see um, a lot of progress here. There's obviously ones where when you start thinking about, okay, well, what does it take to deliver outcomes, right? And you get into more of the... Um, you know, IOT and and data side of things, then, you know, yes, you have industries that are more resistant to that. You know, you mentioned some of the struggles in healthcare. I think, you know, some of those are slower moving than others to work through to get to a point where companies are positioned to deliver outcomes. Um, but I think the other part of this is, you know, ultimately, moving toward that model is it's a mutually beneficial value proposition for both the company and the customer, right? Because when you start talking about going back to point one and point two, so, you know, sort of technologies that allow you to um, improve uh, productivity or reduce costs, and then, you know, things like remote service and AI, you know, when you try to, to incorporate more of those things into a traditional break-fix service model, you start having customers saying like, well, what am I paying you for? Like, yeah. you're not here, right? And it's like, no, but but you have the uptime or you have X, right? And and they're like, right, but you are you didn't come do anything, right? And so yeah. when, you, when you start shifting it to a value-based or outcomes-based narrative, that's when, you know, you can provide an outcome the customer values, but you can also look for those ways to leverage technologies, to lower costs to serve, to improve efficiency without having to figure out how you defend, you know, the, the price point or the revenue side of that. Um, so I think we'll, we'll continue to march along um, that path. Yeah, no, that that's good. And I, and I guess from that, you know, like you said, from an industry perspective and, being able to pivot, it, you know, and a lot of it just comes to the way that we sell, right? Like a lot of these mm -hmm. industries, you got five-year contracts or machines with 10-year life expectancy. So you're talking about a decade or half of a decade to migrate people to like new ways to sell the equipment. So I know, you know, and I've heard of some companies that kind of have that in the pipeline, but mm -hmm. that's from like a it replacement strategy um, as they, we start selling technology as a service or focusing on the outcome. People always mention like the... um the food service companies that do like coffee by the cup, like it's by mm -hmm. the pour versus buying the equipment and having the maintenance. You basically buy the supplies and then you're, and then you're paying uh, by the, by the pour as far as like consuming and utilizing the, the equipment, which is pretty cool. So um, outside of that, and we've gone through the predictions, I guess my, my other question would be outside of sustainability and that being a big difference, right? Especially across Europe, in the US, um, you do your road shows where you go around the, the country and you talk to to leaders in different segments. Um, what are some what are some big uh, takeaways that you've seen or even some big differences you've seen around trends and focuses in the US versus some of the things that they're seeing in Europe? And then also, where are some of the similarities um, yeah. that we're facing regardless of, of what continent we sit on? Yeah. 
Yeah. So we did six events um, in 2023 uh, on the Future of Field Service Live Tour. We started in Sydney, Australia, which was really cool. Um, we had an event in Birmingham in the UK, um, Paris, uh, Minneapolis, Dusseldorf, and um, Stockholm. So uh, decent variety. Um, and I would say, you know, with the exception of the sustainability topic, there is far more in common than there is different. I mean, when, you know, pretty much all of the other, how do we, how do we apply and leverage technology? Um, you know, the, the talent challenges, they may look a little bit different because of, you know, some of the, the regions, um, you know, structure, et cetera, but overall very similar conversations, um, you know, meeting, uh, exceeding customer expectations, um, you know, looking at what is the next phase of our, uh, service value proposition or our growth, um, you know, all of those things are, are really pretty, um, common. And I think, you know, that's one of the things I love about the tour and this platform is, you know, um, bringing people together to share one of my favorite pieces of pe feedback that I get at those events is I feel so much less alone. Yeah. And, you know, it's because everyone is in their day to day, you know, and, and you're trying to solve these challenges or, um, you know, figure out how to realize these opportunities. And you don't have the perspective that people across industries and across the globe are in the same trenches, right? Sometimes you might feel like, oh, I don't have this all figured out, but I bet everyone else does or whatever. And, and I really like being able to have that camaraderie and also give people some reassurance that, you know, um, companies are at varying stages of figuring all of this stuff out. No one has it perfect, right? Um, and, you know, it, it's about not only sharing information with one another, but like being sources of inspiration and, you know, um, having that kind of collective community vibe is, is really helpful. So I, I, you know, I think sustainability is probably the biggest difference I see. Um, I, you know, there are, you get into to more regional differences with sort of the outcomes based or servitization concept as well in terms of, you know, the readiness for the full as a service version of that, but that's a whole sort of continuum. And I think for the most part, the idea of focusing more on the overall value you're providing to a customer versus like a break fix uh, situation is, is pretty consistent. So yeah, it's, um, it's interesting to go to different places and, you know, the conversations are, are different, but they're coming from the same foundational sort of principles, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah, there's like this kind of same same challenges from different perspectives, just given, you know, regional differences or um, some of the challenges. And so and, and I'm going to ask you another question to be, mm -hmm. you know, kind of a, <laughs> kind of a, 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 a hot topic here our, on our own. So. The one thing I've noticed, and I, I was sitting, I you know, I had several advisory board meetings this week, and you've been more around the world, so you can answer it um, for me. Um, I have been one of the youngest people in field service advisory board meetings for the last eight years, um, and I'm for I turned forty one like a week and a half ago, right? So I'm I, to me, I'm not that young anymore uh, compared to when I was in my early thirties. Like, are there places where you're seeing? Um, like a transition in leadership where we're actually seeing younger like service executive leaders like because you've been able to go all over the world or is the industry from a top leadership perspective still gradually aging and we're not really getting that that new class of leadership in um, at least at that executive level with the events that you do? I think at the executive level, it's still aging out, if you will. Um, yeah. Now, you know, you like I said, when we talked about the leadership piece, you know, you can see more and more change kind of coming up through the ranks, if you will. Um, but I would say, you know, if we call this part of the opportunity to bring a lot more diversity into this space, um, I think that's consistent uh, as well. Um, you know, it's... Uh, even at Field Service Europe, so WBR's 
Palm Springs event in Amsterdam. I mean, I think there's probably more diversity in the U S event than there is at that event. Um, yeah. you know, and so it's, you know, there's, there's still a lot of work to be done. And I, I think, you know, that's one of the things that I think will be exciting to see how these predictions or trends or themes continue to unfold as we have, you know, new, um, leaders with fresh perspectives uh and and different thoughts and and ideas on what works uh come in um and and be able to take you know really a, a huge set of possibilities that exist yeah. that aren't really being fully tapped because you still have a lot of leaders in place that are are you know perfectly happy with the way it's always been right yeah. Uh, and just to see how things will continue to change. I think it's going to be really exciting. No, I think that's awesome. And like you said, and I think, and I think, and, you know, and I, again, talking to a lot of uh, other executives in the industry, like it's like, it's actually those that are, that are heading towards retirement that are pushing some of this focus, mm -hmm. right? You know, well, like, there's another generation that needs to come up and we need to get them in and nurture that talent before we leave. <laughs> yeah. uh, Cause they, they do have a lot of um, expertise and a lot of, um, knowledge to pass on right but it's you know like that that step in the ladder wrong right because of a lack of development i don't know if there's a lot of people in the middle that you can yeah. kind of pull all the way to that level and that i think that's why we see a lot of investment and leadership and a lot of discussions around it because a lot of the core people that you know i've seen for for years right or like you know like this year several people were like these are my last yeah. conference and that's yeah. what i'm and that's what i'm thinking about as well and like the size of their organizations and um, and it's almost like everybody's focusing on, and I know people who are focusing internally on like building that bench strength. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, and so I'm sure you'll see some shifting around. We're going to see some executives move from, from one company to another company, but I think it's creating, and we, we use the word several times that imperative that like, yeah, like we are at the point to where like, as leaders, like we're trans transitioning, not to different companies, we're transitioning to retirement. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how the industry changes in the next five years, because like a lot of the people who have led in the industry, a lot of the voices that have been prominent, um, they're retiring, right? And they're mm -hmm. and they're they're handing that over um, to a to just a different set of people who may have a different background, who may come from different um, departments, or who just may have a different um, perspective in general. So I think that'll be interesting to see. And so in the next few years, it'll it'll get very <laughs> very unique uh, at some of these uh, at some of these events. So. I think it's interesting too what you said about, you know, on the leadership piece. Um some of the, you know, like oldest by age, but even by, you know, tenure experience, et cetera, leaders um have the most modern mindsets. And I love seeing that. Like I love yeah. seeing like, you know, you can't assume that just because someone's, you know, X age or, ha you know, looks like this or has been here for this long, that they have this outdated mentality. There's, you know, some leaders that have been in place for quite a long time that are working really hard to drive a lot of this positive change. And I think that's awesome. Um, I don't know if you saw just last week, um, I, uh, shared a podcast with Linda Tucci of, um, ortho clinical diagnostics. Um, yeah. I think it's quite L ortho now. Um, but she, uh, I love Linda and, and she came on to talk about, um, the breast cancer, uh, journey that she's fighting right now. And, and I love that she is very, um, willing to be vulnerable, um, and, you know, have so much respect for that. But one of the things we talked about, because we were talking about what it's taught her in how she leads, but she was saying even before that, even before the pandemic, she always had a practice in place. Um, it didn't used to be quite as frequent, but it was really where she would sort of reflect and take stock on her own leadership style. Yeah. She mentions some resources she used to sort of look at overall trends and things like that. But she would also, you know, ask for some feedback, she would do some self reflection, but she would really look for ways to actually like implement change to continue to make sure that she was being as impactful as she wants to be. And I just thought like, that's such a great 
practice that I'm sure not enough people do. Do you know what I mean? For so many yeah. reasons, they don't want to self-reflect, they're too busy, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. But it's like, you know, we live in this world where things are changing so frequently, so too do what it takes to be as impactful as we want to be, right? So um, I love that idea of, you know, people that that have been doing it for a long time have the opportunity to continually reinvent themselves. And, you know, um, just because you, you know, know things a certain way doesn't mean you have to stick with it, right? You can know, know better and, and do better. So. Yeah. And that's, it's funny. You mentioned Linda, uh, we, we attended the same event in Chicago. So I actually mm -hmm. had dinner with Linda and her and I talked about, um, a few of those things as well. And I think that reflection and that like constant, like evaluation of our, our leadership style and the way that we lead is like, cause a lot of it is like, when do we need to transition? When do we need to change? When are we creating a blocker for the people who mm -hmm. are coming up, um, underneath her? And I, you know, I talked about like, that's why I left my last company because, I was actually the ceiling for the development of everybody else who worked for me because right. The, the next step was for them to take my job. And as long right. as I'm here, um, they can't do it, which is one of the other things I talk about in my book is that transition. Right. So it's that always reflecting, like, am I having the most impact? Am I adding the most value? Um, and as long as you're doing that, if your team is changing, if your company is changing, like you will change. And, and you're right. Like there are some people who, you know, worked at companies for 20, 25 years and I've seen them evolve Mm -hmm. in a lot of different ways, whether it's on AI or outcome or digital transformation um, over the last 10 years that I've been in the industry. So yeah, it's not just about like the experience or the gray in the hair, right? It's just mm -hmm. people who are, are willing to adapt new ideas, who are willing to take on new challenges. Um, and then people who are just, who are just done, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're, they're done and now they're willing and now they're ready to go transition to, to new challenges, just different things in life other than being yeah. Um, in that role at a particular company, which is cool. But um, but no, this has been great conversation. I've been enjoyed interviewing you. I guess well, I'll end with the with do you have a question for me? Like if you had one question for me about 2024, uh, what would it be? I think it would be um, what do you feel is the most valuable lesson you've learned this year? I would say the most valuable lesson I've learned this year is that everyone isn't going to move at the same speed and you have to be patient with other people's pace. Right. So um, I think that's the main, I work at a startup, right? So like some people move really, really fast. Some people need to, you know, legal needs to move slower. Mm -hmm. Finance needs to move a little bit slower. Engineering can move quickly. And I think there, it's very easy to get frustrated when it feels like we're, we're not moving at the same speed, but that's when alignment is important. Mm -hmm. So like if we're aligned and we're going in the same direction, you can go faster than me because like you need to keep going in that direction. But if there's other things that I need to be doing um, to make sure that we're operating safely, to make sure that we're hitting requirements and things of that nature, you can go ahead of me, even though we're going in the same direction. Right. So mm -hmm. um, like my our, my current boss, like loves hiking. Right. So you think about the people that go up Mount Everest for you, like they've gone above you, like. They've, they've secured things. you got a path that's drawn out ahead of you. Um, but I was used to a larger company where we all kind of moved at the same pace because we were already big. We were already mm -hmm. established. Um, so I think that's been the most important thing for me coming into like my my second year at being at a startup is, mm -hmm. is being comfortable. Like those people are always going to run at 90 miles an hour. And I'm fine with that. Like, but we're going to we're going to run at this speed and we will catch up to you because you're going to get done with that. You're going to drop it off and then you're going to move on to the to the the next thing in front of you um, and we'll be there. But yeah, not getting frustrated or losing patience with people who who move faster or slower than you. Right. Because then on the yeah. other side, you have some people that don't move as quickly as you want them to. Uh, but it's you need all of that to be to be balanced within an organization. But the alignment is what's important, not the speed. Yeah. No, that's a good lesson. Um, I struggle with uh, patience myself. <laughs> <laughs> so well, I'm going to ask your you question so back to yeah. you. What is your what is your your main takeaway from 2023 outside of predictions and things that you thought, but just for you personally coming out of this year? Yeah, honestly, it it, it is really similar, and I don't I I'm not trying to steal yours, but it's interesting because um, in November we had the last not the last, we had like a review of the year session in the customer. So I run three global customer groups. Um, 
And we talked about this too. Let, what's your biggest lesson learned, you know? And, and that's what I shared is, um, I think for me, it's, I have to temper the passion that I have with patience and I'm not good at the patience part, but yeah. I get so, you know, it's, I, I, I have to focus on what I can control. Right. And I, and I yeah. need to, um, also, you know, appreciate progress and not just want to race, race, race. Like it's, you know, um, it all counts and I have to kind of, you know, accept that, you know, you can't step over hard work. You have to just take it one step at a time. So, um, yeah. Balancing passion with patience is, is my, I like it. Yeah. yeah. You and I, you and I share the share passions definitely. So, mm -hmm. Um, that's awesome. Well, no, this was, um, it was great. Thank you for, uh, having me on the show here and being able to do your, your year in recap. It's been good seeing you a couple, a couple times this year and spending some time with you in, in London. Sarah's a great, uh, photographer for Instagram. So she got my tower of London photo. It was yes. really nice. Yeah. Um, you, you got to meet my brother. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we did uh, spend some time some together. There in London yeah. Yeah. Interesting things about uh, interesting things about uh, castles and fortresses, but no, it was awesome. It was good seeing you. Thank you for um, even the nomination. I, we didn't mention it, but I was one of the people that was recognized as one of those uh, top 100, and so that was that was a great thing to have this year. It's on the it's on the shelf over there. Uh, it, it is in the office, but um, thank you for IFS and and Hot Topics doing that and um, and elevating those voices and those individuals as well um, on the on the service side of the business. So appreciate that. Yeah, it was very well deserved. Uh, you and the other ninety nine, and also all of those nominated. I mean, um, uh, it's it was a great um, initiative. I hope they do it again next year. It was great to spend some time with you. At well, as well, and I hope in twenty twenty four we get to do it again. Um, and uh, thanks for interviewing me. It's been fun. <laughs> no problem. Thank you, Sarah. You can find more by visiting us at futureoffieldservice.com. The Future of Field Service podcast is published in partnership with IFS. You can learn more at ifs.com. As always, thank you for listening.